today we're going to be talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You know, um, took me a long time to understand this. I grew up Baptist, grew up in a denominational church that did not believe in two experiences with the Holy Spirit. They believe when you accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior that you got the Holy Spirit which is true, but it's also um, problematic when you talk about that because <clears throat> when you study Scripture, it, it goes to show, and we're going to show some interesting Scriptures that prove to you that there is a more than one experience, okay? So just for, a, I'm just going to say this right now. Uh, today we're going to be talking about tongues. So if you want to know about tongues, stay tuned. If you want to know about the spiritual gifts, stay tuned. If you want to know about this weird thing, about the Holy Spirit thing, stay tuned. Um, we're going to get into it and it's going to be very in-depth and it's going to be very helpful. Um, one of the big reasons I haven't taught on it in so long is because it's kind of a fairly new thing for me. I grew up in the church, you know, I was born again when I was really young, um, and grew up in the church and probably was saved <clears throat> 14 years or, or maybe 15 years before I ever heard about this baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, don't get me wrong. I did hear the phrase baptism of the Holy Spirit. But the baptism of the Holy Spirit was explained to me when I was a child that that's your born-again experience, okay? And then I started reading the book of Acts and got a little confused, okay? But it wasn't actually me reading the book of Acts that got me confused. Thank God I stumbled upon a Bible study group that was a little bit crazy and that did things a little bit unorthodox that people would probably consider unbiblical because of the way they did things, but I'm actually glad it happened that way. The reason why is because it kind of shook the religion out of me and allowed me to really seek God, okay? Because I wanted to do it right, okay? So, <clears throat> baptism of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Again, I'll just I'm gonna brief synopsis. I'm going to give you an introductory what it is like in about two seconds. Here's what it is. First of all, <clears throat> we have what's called an experience called the born again experience. Okay, the born again experience. This is John chapter 3. When Jesus is talking to Nicodemus and he tells him, you must be born again. Let's go ahead and go over there to John chapter 3, Bible Gateway. Whoopsies. It says right here, verse 3, Jesus answered him, truly, it's up here I got it on the screen for you. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus, he's a Pharisee, said, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Truly, I say to you, unless one is born of the water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Now, when I read this first time, I thought to myself, the water, is that baptism? And I don't think it's baptism. I think it's talking about your... Uh, uh, it's talking about flesh. And the reason why I say it's talking about flesh is because verse 6 re-emphasizes and further explains what he mean. Unless one's born of the spirit and uh, one of the unless one is born of the water and the spirit, <clears throat> he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Verse 6 that that which is born of the flesh is flesh, that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I say to you you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from for where it goes. So, or where it goes, so it is with everyone who's born of the Spirit. So here we know that being born of the water is not, is not water baptism. It is spirit, it is flesh birth, okay? Now, there is a water baptism that every person actually must take place in to even come into this life, okay? We are all baptized before we're even born, why do I say that? Baptism is a type and shadow of what God is doing, the washing away of all of our sins. This is why whenever the flood came in Noah's time, the water covered the entire earth. That was a baptism. Did you know that? So Noah, flo not Noah, God flooded the world in Noah's time and he baptized the world and he washed away all the sin. That's why the flood came, right? For he saw that all their hearts were evil, and every wicked thought, every every thought of theirs was wicked, and so he sent the flood, right? And he put Noah on a boat, and boat a flo uh, Noah, Noah, Noah floated it on the boat, 
<clears throat> Did you know it took a year for that water to go away? The flood covered the earth for a year. Okay. Now, <clears throat> we say, oh, it rained 40 days and 40 nights. No, but it rained 40 days and 40 nights, but then the water, it took a year for it to recede. Powerful stuff. Okay. Now, here's the cool thing. We must be born of the water. There is a, there is a, a water that every one of us are baptized into in the flesh. It is called the amniotic sac. When you're in your mother's womb, you're floating around in water. You know that? Have you ever heard the phrase, my water broke? Your mother's water had to break before she gave birth to you. You were submerged. You were baptized in water before you were even born. This is part of the reason why you're baptized, I believe, because it's showing when you get, when you get water baptized, it's a type and shadow. It's a sign that you have now been born again. You see what I'm saying? Born again. What does that mean? Born again. It means previously you were born. Now you're being born a second time. Okay? So we are born of the water in the flesh. And the reason why I know for, I believe with all my heart that that is not talking about uh, water baptism when you get saved. It's talking about flesh gives birth to flesh. Okay? Water gives birth to water. Okay? And spirit gives birth to spirit. Does it make sense? Okay. So <clears throat> we know that <clears throat> this part right here, John chapter 3, verse 3 through verse 7, is the born again experience. Okay? Whenever you, when you profess your faith in Christ, the gospel of John says this. Let's go over to John. Chapter 1, verse 12 says, But to all who believe in him and accept him, he gave the right to become children of God. Children of God. Again, we're talking about the born-again experience. To become a child of God, you must be born of God. You hear that? To be a child of God... You must be born of God. So John chapter 1 says here, verse 12, but to all who believed in him and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. You want to become born again? It says it right here. You must believe and accept him. So we're going to keep on reading John chapter 3, verse <clears throat> 9. Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? Jesus answered him, are you the teacher of Israel and yet you do not understand these things? Truly I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. So you want to be born again? You want to live forever? You want to have eternal life? You must believe in him, verse 15, right? And what he's talking about here <clears throat> is back in Noah's, back in Moses' time, their serpents were coming and biting the people because they were rebelling against God. And then he took a bronze serpent, put it on a staff, or lifted it up in the, in, the, in the wilderness and said, if you look at the serpent that's been lifted up on this pole, you will be saved. So they would look at the serpent, the bronze serpent that was lifted up on the pole, and then they would be healed of their infection from their, their afflictions from the snake bites. Genesis chapter 1 says he will strike his heel and he will crush his head. Talking about the snake. So we've all been infected with sin. We've all been bitten by sin, by this serpent. We must look to Christ. When we put our faith in Christ, then we'll be saved. John chapter 3, verse 16. This one everybody knows. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life or eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Watch this verse 18. This is what people don't read. They read verse 16 and 17, but they don't like verse 18. Whoever believes in him <clears throat> is not condemned, but whoever does not believe in, his, in him is condemned already. Let me say it again. You're condemned already. If you don't put your faith in Christ, you're condemned already. So I've heard people say to me, are you telling me, Zach, that if I reject Christ and if I don't accept him as my Lord and Savior, that I will, that I'll go to hell? 
And people get confused about this. They think that it has to do with God getting mad at you because you rejected his son. No, the truth is you're already condemned. <laughs> it's like... <coughs> oh, right? Of course I'm telling you if you reject him, you're not going to be saved. Because you're already... It's like this. <clears throat> it's like if the fire department came to your house when it's lit on fire, and your house is burning up ablaze, going up... 100 feet in the air, right? And the fire department comes there with their fire trucks and wants to start spraying water on it, and you tell them, no, 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 no. And then you get mad because your house burns down. No, your house is already burning. The fire department's not even doing it. It's just burning. The fire department came to put the fire out. Jesus came to put the fire out. See what I'm saying? We can't get mad. Oh, are you telling me God's going to reject me because I rejected his son? No, no, you've already been rejected because of sin. We're already condemned already. We need Christ to save us. He's the life preserver. If, I, if you're out there in the Lord, you've heard me say this before. If you're out there, if I'm at the Titanic, right, and everybody's sinking and everybody's in the cold, freezing water, <clears throat> and I throw you a life preserver and you say, are you telling me that if I don't hold on to this life preserver, I'm going to freeze and die? Yes, you dummy. Yes, I am. Yes, I am. Please grab it. Please don't be stupid. <laughs> right? That's what Jesus is. Jesus is a life preserver. <laughs> <laughs> because he has not believed in the name of the only son of God. Verse 19, and this is the judgment. The light has come to the world and people love the darkness rather than the light because of their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light. Think about it. Have you ever done bad things and you just don't want to come to the light about it? Yeah. Right? You're allowing that deed, you're allowing that wickedness to overtake your heart to the point where you despise coming to the light. That's a very dangerous spot to be in. People love darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to light. Like cockroaches, when they flood, when they fly away, when you lift up a, a bench and there's a bunch of cockroaches, they just, they, why do they don't like the light? They're trying to hide. They're trying to get back underneath something. There's a part of us that's like a cockroach, man. We just like our darkness. We need to come to the light, baby, right? <clears throat> For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. Amen? Okay, so that's, this is the baptism. I mean, this is the born-again experience with God. When you get born again, the Bible says that the Holy Spirit makes his dwelling with us, okay? So we are born of the spirit they're born of the spirit if you're born of the spirit it means you have the holy spirit within you does that make sense so if you're writing notes you can put inside holy spirit is inside okay <clears throat> now can y'all still see if i go to this other document here can y'all see what i'm doing yeah okay good <clears throat> all right so, that's the only experience of the Holy Spirit that I was ever taught about growing up, okay? And so every time you see anything that had to do with the Holy Spirit, you would think that that was the born-again experience, you know? Talking about being baptized in the Holy Spirit. So in Acts chapter 2, when the Holy Spirit came, I'd always hear people say, the first time people would say this is so dangerous. This really got messed me up. They would tell me in the Baptist church growing up, I'm not trying to be knocking on the Baptist church. I'm just trying to relate with anybody who's Baptist, okay? I'm not trying to knock the Baptist church because uh, one thing the Baptist church did for me was it taught me to read my Bible. Because when I started doing these things, when I started to discover some of these things, and people, when somebody came up to me one time and said, Zach, <clears throat> do you believe in speaking in tongues? I said, no. And they're like, well, why? I said, well, show me in the Bible and I'll believe it. And they couldn't tell me. They couldn't show me where it was in the Bible and it aggravated me. So what I found out was, you know, even though the Baptists, you know, don't teach all these things, and I'm just saying this, like, hopefully this will change in the next 50 years, you know, and, and maybe we'll get a bunch of tongue-talking Baptists eventually. But right now we've got a bunch of people that don't, and the reason why is because they, they become too dogmatic in their thinking and they stop reading their scriptures. But the Baptists are the one who taught me to read my Bible. They say this. Here's what's funny. They'd say, God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. They'd say that because I think it's in Habakkuk. God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. But then they say, yeah, but he doesn't do those, those healings anymore. Oh, he doesn't do those spiritual gifts no more. Wait, I thought he was the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Yeah. What's going on? You know, but then they also tell me 
<clears throat> read your Bible, read your whole Bible, and this is your final authority. So my mother would teach me this. Zach, it doesn't matter if that guy's up there teaching the Word of God. Your job is to, is to, is to question what he's saying. I'm like, huh? Yeah, he's the pastor, but when he's preaching the Word, you go back and read it for yourself and make sure that he's teaching it the right way. Because a lot of people will get up and talk, and they don't have real scriptural basis. They're just talking out of their rear. You know, and they, or they don't have, or they're talking out of their understanding as best they know how. But be, be wary because there are false teachers out there. They don't, they don't teach the whole word, right? And so that challenged me. So again, being Baptist is actually maybe not a Baptist because they taught me how to read my word, right? Again, I'm not trying to knock the Baptist. I'm just saying I grew up Baptist. I am a Baptist, you know, but I've become much more uh, charismatic in my approach. Make sense? Um, and I got really good roots in, as a Baptist. So I don't, and I'm, I, I'm, I'm happy to be a Baptist. I'm frustrated with people who teach me to read my Bible that don't read their Bible, though. <laughs> Make sense? You taught me to read my Bible, but you don't read yours. That's frustrating. You see what I'm saying? So I wish that, I just wish that all the Baptists would get slain in the Holy Spirit, baptized in the Holy Spirit, and start speaking in tongues. And then you'd have some Bible-believing, you'd have some hardcore people. I'm telling you what, all right? <clears throat> Inside the Spirit, right? So there's several instances, here, I, there are several instances uh, put it up here on the screen in the New Testament that show a separate experience with the Holy Spirit other than the born again experience. First of all, the disciples received the Holy Spirit before Jesus ascended to the Father. Now, <clears throat> this is something that really trips up the churches I grew up in because they say, wait, the Holy Spirit never came until Acts chapter 2. So if you go over to Acts chapter 2, yeah. they'd tell you, look, right here. <clears throat> Jesus told them in Acts chapter 1, and actually it's in the end of Luke 2. It says, don't go anywhere until you've received power from on high. But you will receive power, Acts chapter 1, verse 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses telling people about me everywhere in, the, in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, and in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. This is Jesus talking to the disciples, telling them, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, right? So he's prophesying to them, and he's about to go up in heaven, right? Immediately, verse 9, after saying this, he was taken up in a cloud, okay? And they no longer saw him. So this is the last time they saw Jesus. Jesus ascended into heaven, okay? And he told them, wait here till the Holy Spirit comes. Now, what's funny about this is, he ascended, right? And he says, the same way you saw him leave, he'll come again. Now, what's really interesting about this is, I know people say this, you know, well, Jesus is going to come back. And we make a big deal about this ascension experience. But y'all know that, that he came back again already and talked to Paul. <laughs> he appeared on the road to Damascus, which is just bizarre because you're thinking, okay, for 40 days, he was coming and appearing to the apostles. And then he ascended into heaven, right? And then the angel said, why are you standing here? Quit watching. Go out and do what you're doing. He was, he was trying to commission them. 40 days of proof that he had risen from the dead, right? That's what happened. But, but then, he, then he ascended. But we know that he somehow revealed himself again to Paul. And even today, he reveals himself to people in the Islam countries, in the, Islam, in the Islamic countries that are praying and seeking God with all their heart. Jesus shows up in dreams. But Paul experienced him, boom, in person. Bam! Knocked him off his horse, Right? So it's kind of weird. I feel like that's kind of a weird thing. It's like an exception to the rule. He ascended, but then he came back and saw Paul. Weird. Anyway, just thought, right? Okay, so check this out. You will receive power, right? So verse chapter 2 says right here that the Holy Spirit came. And on the day of Pentecost, verse 1, all the believers were meeting together in one place. Suddenly there was a sound from heaven like the roaring of a mighty windstorm, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting, then what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared on, on, and settled on each of them, and everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages, as the Holy Spirit gave them ability. At that time, there were devout Jews from every nation living in Jerusalem. When they heard the loud noise, everyone came running, and they were bewildered to hear their own languages being spoken to the, by the believers. They were completely amazed. How can this be, they explained. These people are from Galilee, and yet we hear them speaking in our own native languages, he, here we are, Parthians, Medes, 
Elamites, people from Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, the, the province of Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and the heirs of Libya, from Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and, conver and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs. And we all hear these people speaking in our own languages about the wonderful things God has done. So they were preaching the gospel. They stood there amazed and perplexed. What can this mean, they asked each other. But others in the crowd rid ridiculed them, saying, they're, they're drunk. They've been drunk, that's all. Peter stepped out forward with 11 other apostles and shouted to the crowd, listen carefully, all of you. Fellow Jews and residents of Jerusalem, make no mistake about this. These people are not drunk, as some of you are assumed. Nine o'clock in the morning is much too early for that. No, what you see was predicted long ago by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit upon all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions and your old men will dream dreams. In those days, I will pour out my spirit, even on my servants, men and women alike, and they will prophesy and I will cause wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below blood and fire and clouds of smoke. The sun will become dark. And the moon will turn blood red before that great and glorious day of, of the Lord arrives. But everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved, right? So then he preaches, people of Israel, listen, God publicly endorsed Jesus, the Nazarene, by doing powerful miracles, wonders, and signs through him, as you well know. But God knew what would happen, and his prearranged plan was carried out when Jesus was betrayed with the help of the lawless Gentiles, you nailed him to a cross and killed him, but God released him from the horrors of death and raised him back to life for death, could not keep him in its grip. All right, so then 3,000 people get saved. All right, amazing, right? So we see here in Acts chapter 2 that the Holy Spirit came. And this is whenever, in the churches I grew up, they're like, this is when the Holy Spirit came. And they'd say this all the time, for the first time. And it's not true. This is not the first time the Holy Spirit came. In the beginning, God created the heavens of the earth and the Spirit hovered over the depths of the waters. Very, very, very beginning, the Holy Spirit was here. Then we see also several instances where the Holy Spirit was there. The Bible says that Saul went on his way to kill David and the Spirit overtook him. And he started speaking, or he started prophesying and ripped his clothes off and got naked. <laughs> Multiple times throughout the whole, <clears throat> the, spirit, the Bible says Elijah was prophesying to Ahab and he saw a little cloud and, and he's like, it's going to rain again. And Ahab takes off in his chariot and the Bible says the spirit caught him up and he ran faster than the chariot. The spirit, what spirit? Right? So this Holy Spirit happened several times. You can just you just study it. Just look it up. When did the Holy Spirit come in the Old Testament? There was actually one time whenever um, <clears throat> the, the Bible says that the fire came down and consumed the sacrifice, which we're actually going to talk a little bit about here in a minute. And I believe that's one of the main one of the big ways that the Holy Spirit came in the Old Testament, whenever he ordained uh, the temple. Okay? Um, but even more closely to Acts chapter 2, Within the 40 days after Jesus rose again from the dead, Jesus gave the Holy Spirit. Let's go here. First off, right here, the disciples received the Holy Spirit birth before Jesus ascended to the Father. Okay? In fact, Jesus himself gave the spiritual birth to the disciples in John chapter 20. So notice in Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 1, verse 9. Jesus told them in verse 8, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And in verse 9, he ascends into heaven. So he has departed. Chapter 2, he is still departed. But they receive this experience with the Holy Spirit. So note this. Keep this in mind. Acts chapter 1, verse 9, he ascends. Acts chapter 2, verse 1, Holy Spirit comes. Okay? After Jesus has left. That's clear. Everybody knows that. What people don't know is John chapter 20, verse 19. Jesus is present. Jesus is in the room whenever the Holy Spirit comes. Watch this. John chapter 20, verse 19 through 23. <clears throat> that Sunday evening, this, the disciples were meeting behind locked doors because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders. Suddenly, Jesus was standing there among them. Peace be with you, he said. Verse 20, as he spoke, he showed them the wounds in his hands and in his side, <clears throat> they were filled with joy when they saw the, 
saw the Lord. Verse 21. Again, he said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. Then he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Now, this is so important. I can't believe I never heard this growing up in church. You know why I never heard this growing up in church? Because it would really mess up their thought process that the Holy Spirit came in Acts chapter 2. Because right here it says, and he breathed on them. Now, this is very important. He breathed on them. Why is this important? Because in, the, in Genesis, when God created Adam, he took Adam and he formed him out of the dust of the ground and then he breathed into his nostrils. And the word breath in the Old Testament when he created Adam, the word breath is the same word, it's the Hebrew word ruach. The word ruach means breath, but it also means spirit. God's spirit, he breathed into Adam whoo, the spirit of God. In fact, I believe that's the reason why Adam was in the image of God, not because he had hands, feet, a nose, eyes, ears, and a mouth. He was the image of God because of the spirit that was within him. That's why he was in the image of God. But when he sinned, he lost that image. When he sinned, he was separated from the Ruach. He says, because when you eat of that tree, this is what God told Adam, in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. When he did that, Ruach left him. He died that moment. That's the reason why his body could not continue on. But it's such a powerful breath. He lived 900 something years. But in the day that he ate of that tree, he lost that image. He was separated from God. The Ruach left him. The Spirit left him. And you can't be separated from your Creator and continue to live. You can't be separated from the author of life and have life. You must be connected to the vine or you will wither too, right? Verse 22, and he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Now, this is so plain and in your face. Breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. This was a creation experience. Jesus Christ, the author and finisher of your faith. Jesus Christ, the word of God, who by him all things were made, was in the room breathing on them the Holy Spirit. Receive the Holy Spirit. This is their born again experience. This is the moment when they received God's Spirit and became a new creation. You know that there's no other person in the Bible besides Adam and Jesus that are, that are, that are, well, look, Adam was created in the image of God, but no one else claimed, yeah, I look like God until Jesus. When Philip said, show us the father, he said, have I not been with you this whole time, Philip? You don't know who I am. If you've seen me, you've seen the father. Why? Because of the Holy Spirit. Adam, I want you to notice this. Adam was born of the Holy Spirit. Oh, but Zach, only the New Testament people are born of the Holy Spirit. No, Adam was born of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus was born of the Holy Spirit. And people are going to say, no, 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 Zach, don't say that because you're going to make Adam like God. No, I'm not making Adam like God. I'm making Adam God's son. How do I know that? Because of the, the gospel of Luke and the genealogies of Luke. Just go over to Luke real quick. Luke chapter 3. <clears throat> Watch this. We'll just start with uh, Methuselah, right? So Noah, first, uh, Acts chapter, in Luke chapter 3, verse 36. The son of Canaan, the son of Arphazah, the son of Shem, the son, so it's, talking about, uh, it's talking about the lineage of Jesus, right? It goes all the way back. So all the way back to the son of Canaan, the son of Arphazah, the son of 
Shem, the son of Noah, the son of Lamech, the son of Methuselah, the son of Enoch, the son of Jared, the son of Mahalel, the son of Canaan, the son of Enos, the son of Seth, the son of Adam, the son of God. What? Ain't nobody ever taught that before. Adam is the son of God? Why is he the son of God? Because he was born of the Holy Spirit, guys. Adam was born of the Spirit of God. Oh, it's a really skinny O. <laughs> Jesus was born of the Holy Spirit too. How do we know that? Because Mary asked, how can this be? I've not been with a man. He says, the Holy Spirit will overshadow you and you'll give birth. You'll conceive a son. You'll name him Jesus. Jesus means deliverer. Powerful stuff. Jesus is born of the Holy Spirit. Okay? Adam is born of the Holy Spirit. Jesus is born of the Holy Spirit. So now we become sons of God. How do we become sons of God? We get born of the Holy Spirit. You see? Powerful stuff. Why did Jesus... Why are we finally able to be born of the Holy Spirit? And we know that in the Old Testament, you could not be born of the Holy Spirit. Okay? Adam was born of the Holy Spirit, but he lost it. The only thing he could give you was the flesh. So he gave you his seed, which was fleshly. But Jesus gives you his seed, which is spiritual. He restored back to Adam, because Adam lives through all of us. We live because of Adam. You see what I'm saying? But we also die because of Adam. And we live forever because of Jesus, because Jesus restored back to humankind what it was missing, which was the Spirit of God. Am I making sense? Why does man die? Because he does not have the Spirit of God. And so one day we will die in the flesh. But the, Jesus said, if you believe in me, even if you believe, if you believe in me, even if though you die, you shall not die. The reason why is because God will resurrect us and breathe new life back into us. We will have already been connected to God. We cannot perish. Amen? All right. Does that make sense? Cool? Anybody learn anything? He breathed on them. Receive the Holy Spirit. Verse 23. If you forgive anyone's sins, they're forgiven. If you don't forgive them, they're not forgiven. Now, that's some crazy authority. <coughs> he just told his disciples they have some really crazy forgiveness authority. Then in Luke, Jesus tells them to wait for the Holy Spirit to clothe them with power from on high. So now, at the beginning, we said this Holy Spirit born again experience is on the inside. Now we're going to be talking about the outside. There's something that happens on the exterior. So when you put your faith in Christ, the Holy Spirit came in and made his home inside of you. You were born again. But now what we're talking about is an exterior experience, the Holy Spirit. Make sense? Luke chapter 24, verse 45 through 49. Then he opened their eyes to understand the scriptures. He said, yes, it was written long ago that the Messiah would suffer and die and rise from the dead on the third day. It was also written that this message would be proclaimed in the authority of his name to all the nations Beginning in Jerusalem, there is forgiveness of sins for all who repent. Wow. There is forgiveness of sins for all who repent. You are witnesses of all these things. And now I will send the Holy Spirit, Jesus, um, just as my Father promised. Watch this. But stay here in the city until the Spirit comes and fills you with power from heaven. Okay. So now we have this one, which is, I call it the seal. It's the deposit, okay? But this one is the power. This one's the power. He closed you. Now, this, I'm reading the New Living Translation, but there's another translation that says, it doesn't say fills you. It says it clothes you. So he clothes you. The reason why that's important is because the clothing is exterior. It's not interior. <clears throat> Luke chapter 24, verse 49. Yeah, in the NIV it says <clears throat> <clears throat> 
You are witnesses of these things. Behold, I'm sending you the promise of the Father upon you, but of my Father upon you. But stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. This is the English Standard Version. Clothed with power from on high. So I was, I'm sending the promise of the Father upon you. So he breathed in them and breathed on them, but that breathing is symbolic of going into the nostrils, right? Just like Adam. So they, they, they received the life-giving spirit of God, the everlasting spirit of God, the one that gives you everlasting life. Now they're going to receive a spirit that brings power, okay? This one has to do with life, Everlasting life, and this one has to do with power. It serves two different purposes. It, I'm going to say it again. It serves two different purposes. Okay? <clears throat> two different purposes. Close you with power from on high. Okay? We already read in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. <clears throat> but you will receive the power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere you go. You know what that means, guys? When you receive the Spirit of God upon you, like, like, like clothing, it comes on you with power, you will be witnesses of God. What does that mean? First-hand witnesses of what God can do in your life. Now you shall go and be a witness. You know what a witness does? A witness testifies. Testify. You know what a witness does? Testifies. A witness is not silent. People say this all the time. You know, we ought to just preach the gospel, and if we have to, use words. Do you know what the word preach means? The word preach means to proclaim with your freaking mouth, man. <laughs> you can't preach the gospel without saying words. I'm just saying it. What that phrase is supposed to teach you <laughs> is that you should that exemplifies Christ. But I'm telling you what, no one has ever gotten saved by looking at your good lifestyle. I will say this, people might be turned away by your poor lifestyle. And I'm talking about abundance and riches in this. I'm talking about people will, I'm talking about your, if you are not exemplifying Christ in your life and you try to preach the gospel, people might be turned away because of your lifestyle, because you're not really bringing God glory in your life. Yeah. the way you're behaving, you could turn people away. No, it's not really, you're not going to get anyone saved by just doing good things. You're not. It's not going to happen. Hey, not going to happen. You have to proclaim the good news. How do we know this? Because faith comes by hearing yeah. and hearing by the word of God. You cannot have faith without a word. And you cannot be saved apart from faith. It doesn't say, the Bible says, hey, <clears throat> you know, show everybody your good, your good deeds and they'll believe in God. No. <laughs> it says they'll give glory to God. But that's not saving. How do I know? Giving, did you know glory to God, giving glory to God doesn't save you? You know how I know that? Ask the guy who hid the silver in the belt underneath the ground. And Joshua told him, give glory to God. So he told the story, what happened, and then he got stoned to death. Giving glory to God doesn't save you. <laughs> Putting your faith in God for his forgiveness of sins through the Son of Jesus Christ, through the Son named Jesus Christ, who is the propitiation of your sins, who died and rose again to give you new life and satisfy the demands of the law. If you don't put your faith in that, you can't be saved. You can't. That'd be like, that'd be like look, me looking at Matt, and Matt figured out how to run a business and became filthy rich, and I just looked at him and I said, you know what? Man, he's really rich. I'm going to be rich too. And then imagining that somehow I'm just going to be rich by watching him. No. <laughs> if I want to be rich, I need to ask him, hey, how'd you get rich? And he's got to tell me how to get rich. Does that make sense? He's got to teach me. This is how you run a business, Zach. Make sense? No one gets, no one has life change by watching someone else's life change. They have to implement also the truth. 
Make sense? Okay. All right. I beat that dead horse. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you'll be my witnesses telling people about me everywhere. If you're not telling people about him everywhere, maybe you don't have the Holy Spirit on your, on your life. Then one verse later, he ascends. I already told you that. Acts chapter, verse one, chapter 1, verse 9. So you see that Jesus gave the Holy Spirit being born again before he ever ascended to the Father. And then he promised also to send the Holy Spirit in a different way later on when he was gone. And that was a fulfilled in Acts chapter 2. And I already read that to you, okay? Um, all right, I wrote on here. This experience of the, of the power of the Holy Spirit would manifest itself in different ways throughout the book of Acts with different disciples slash believers also the same believers. The apostles were filled multiple times. And I don't have a scripture reference, but I'll, I'll, I'll have to show that. Maybe we can put that up there in the teaching. And the conclusion that the writers of Acts came to is very different than what many pastors nowadays will acknowledge. Right? So I remember taking this, a few of these passages. I'll tell you in a minute. I'll keep reading. It's, separate, it's a separate, distinct experience from that of being born again in which almost all Christians agree that you do receive a deposit of the Holy Spirit. Everybody believes that. What many Christians do not acknowledge is the second experience of the Holy Spirit, but this is in direct contradiction to the Scripture. scripture. So uh, fortunately, um, I've got a shortcut here. So we're going to go ahead and take a break here in a second um, and come back and uh, go through this. Um, but just give just sum up this one teaching here. Um, there's definitely two in distinct experiences. We have the born again moment, and we have the baptism of the Holy Spirit moment. Okay, um, and so when we come back, we'll talk more about it. Cool. All right. So praise the Lord. I hope everybody here um, in today's teaching uh, on YouTube and Facebook um, really got something out of this, and I'm showing you that there's clearly two times where Jesus actually brought the Holy Spirit. And so I hope that helps. Um, come back, listen to the second part. This is actually, we're actually teaching this um, whole teaching on one session. But since you guys are online, you're not going to get to have that benefit. The guys sitting here in the room get to hear the whole thing. But uh, we're all going to take a break. So let's pray it out. Rhett, will you pray it out? Thank you guys for watching. I hope this teaching blessed you and, and inspired you and helped you out a little bit. Man, if, if it was a blessing for you, please uh, share the video, like it, leave a comment if you have questions. I'll be, I'll try to answer these questions and whatnot. And don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Go to our Facebook page and make sure you've already liked the page. Hover your mouse over following and make sure see first is checked. If there's a check mark there, then you know that you'll be seeing our videos in your news feed. Also, if you're wanting to support our ministry and help fund missions work and help uh, support drug and alcohol recovery, please go to our website, boldestalignedministries.com or www.balmzs.com and you'll see here there's a donate button. You just hit this donate button right there. It'll give you an opportunity to, to sow into the ministry. Right there, you can see Boldest Align Ministries. You can give 30 bucks a month, $50 a month, or $100 a month, or just a one-time gift if you want. Also, you can go to our website, 3rcandles.com. Remember, all the candles are handmade by our students in recovery, and so you can select from our wide range of products. I mean, we just have tons of candles, you can see right there. And also, be sure to sign up for the VIP offers. We can get 25% off your next purchase. You'll be able to receive offers we have. We're also gonna be doing some free test strips for fragrance as well so make sure that you sign up right here and, and all that good stuff so have a good day